Can you Bible with you this morning, or your smartphone has a Bible app, why don't you go ahead and get it out and open it up to the New Testament book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews chapter 10. We're actually going to begin a new series of sermons today that we're going to call Count Me In. Over the next couple of weeks, Yell and I are going to challenge you to evaluate your involvement in this new work. And hopefully as you do, you'll be challenged to become even more involved than you were before you came to the Compass Christian Church. You see, whether or not you know it, you, when you committed to the membership of the Lord's Church, you became a part of a very special 2,000-year-old God-ordained institution. It was Jesus himself who said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. Later, the Apostle Peter would write in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, As you come to him, the living stone, of course, speaking of Jesus Christ, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. You see, the Apostle Peter is comparing the church to a building. I know some of you are wondering what that noise is. <laughs> We have some vents in the ceiling. I hate to break that character here, but we have some vents in the ceiling. And when there's too much CO2, too much hot air in the room, did you notice it came open when I came up? <laughs> but that sound you hear, that sound you hear is the vents opening and let some fresh air. And I hope you understand it. It's just one of those things you have to live with. And so uh, let me try to get back on track here. I just want to let you know what that was. It's a unique word. I was afraid some of you were getting your backs together and worried about this, like something's happening, we're getting out of here. So. But anyway, the Apostle Peter, as I mentioned earlier, was comparing the church to a building in which we are living stones. We are called to support one another. That's why the Bible commands us to love one another, to pray for one another, to encourage one another, to edify one another, to accept one another, to instruct one another, to serve one another, to forgive one another. You see, the Lord intends for the Christian life to be lived in community, folks, not in isolation. And if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know that the Christian life can be rather tedious. And the temptations of this world are often hard to resist. But the Lord never intended for you to, to make it as a maverick on your own. He established the community called the church to strengthen you and to encourage you. You may recall in the book of Acts, chapter 2, it reports that when the believers were baptized, the Bible says that the Lord added them to the church, those who were being saved. They didn't have the option of joining the church if they wanted to. They were automatically added to the church by God himself. That's why we don't regard church membership cavalierly. In other words, like you belong to some booster club or some civic organization where you participate when it's convenient. We need to understand that being part of the church is being involved in the eternal work of Jesus Christ himself. It's the most important enterprise in the world. The Bible says that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. And we should love the church as well and be willing to sacrifice for it. In fact, I would go as far as to say, if you don't intend on taking church membership here at Compass seriously, then don't bother. Jesus said, I would rather you be hot or cold rather than lukewarm. And then he went on to say that stagnant, indifferent believers made them nauseous. And I'll be honest with you, over the years I have come to believe that as a minister, I would rather be involved with a small group of poor, committed people than hundreds of nominal members to whom the church means very little. That's why I want to kick off this new sermon series that we're going to call Count Me In. Because as we begin this new ministry together, I want us to seriously reevaluate what church membership means. And over the next several weeks, when we conclude this series, I hope that you will not only know what's expected of you as a member of the body of Christ, but you will say a new Count Me In. Now, there are a variety of reasons for this sermon series. The most important one I mentioned earlier is that we want to heighten the level of spiritual commitment for those of you who call the Compass Christian Church your home. In other words, we want you to we want you to understand that being a member of this church means something. But another reason, and this gives us the opportunity, is to clarify for you what and who, what membership should be, and what it should mean. 
You see, some people simply think that they're members because they attend a service once or twice a year. Or maybe they give a financial gift to the church on occasion. Church membership, as we understand, is available to those who at some point in their life have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and the Savior, have been baptized into Him, have publicly declared their desire to, to join along the membership of the local congregation. But it's so much more than that, folks. And so over the next couple of weeks, I want us to talk just about some of the expectations of church membership for those of us who call or want to call the Compass Christian Church our home. Now today we're going to begin, we're going to kick off this series with the expectation to commit to worship week. And as we do, I want us to look at the why, why church weekly worship is important and, and how we prepare for that. Let's start with the why. Why is weekly worship important? Well, Hebrews chapter 10, the passage that I asked you to turn to earlier, if you haven't already done so, please do so now. But in Hebrews chapter 10, look down at verse 24 and verse 25. We read the writer saying, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, I like the way that the message version paraphrases that verse. It says, let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out, not avoiding worship together as some do, but spurring each other on. Now, I know when I talk about weekly worship, there are some people who immediately top out and say, well, I can worship in my own backyard, I'm looking out of God's creation. Or I can worship down by the lake. Or I can worship listening to music in my car. There's no reason I have to go to the church building. Of course, my favorite one is when the one who says, my friends who say, well, I can worship out on the golf course. Well, if you can do that, you're a better golfer than I am, folks. Because I can't worship out there. Now, I do pray a lot when I pray to play golf. <laughs> and I've heard a lot of people use God's name when out on the golf course. But I'm not sure we can call that true worship, folks. So you see, you can worship the Lord while you're outside, while you're riding in the car. No one's denying that. But there are several reasons why I think we ought to expect you to be worshiping weekly together with other Christians. First of all, to follow the example of Jesus himself. In Luke chapter 4, verse 16, speaking of Jesus, we read, He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath, look at that phrase, on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. Did you catch that, folks? Now, there are some customs, some habits that we ought to be establishing. If you're a parent, your kids and your grandkids, I would believe, will benefit greatly from you helping them develop good habits. And so I think we ought to start the habit of going to church every Sunday with our children. And that habit ought to start early on. Let them know very early in their life that going to church is not open for discussion, folks. That we're not going to vote on it in the morning or the night before. In fact, I'll be honest with you, there should be no question in your children's life that the Lord fits in your schedule regardless of sports activities or family activities or, or even sleeping in on Sunday morning. By the way, did you know that a recent study revealed that if neither parent nor mom or dad attends church regularly, then less, less than 6% of those children will attend church when they grow up. That study went on to say that if only mom attends regularly, 15% of those children will be faithful in their church attendance when they grow older. Here's what I want to hear. Then that study went on to say that if only dad attends that statistic of children who remain faithful in their church attendance when they grow up jumps up to 55%. And here's the kicker. When both parents attend church regularly, those children who will remain faithful in their church attendance when they grow up, it's 84%. Moms and dads, did you hear that? King David wrote in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And so I do believe that there ought to be some joy when we come together and worship. I don't believe in a church that has to be reverent when you come in from the time you walk into the time that you leave. Now, I'm not saying against 
churches that practice that, but I think there is a sense of excitement and joy when the body of Christ comes together. Woo! There you go. <laughs> and I think we ought to fan those opportunities, whether it be coffee beforehand, whether it be staying afterward to enjoy each other's fellowship, not rushing out here. I just think there ought to be a sense of joy when God's people come together. The church ought to be something that we look forward to, folks. We look forward to experiencing, not a drudgery. And so understand this morning that we worship regularly because we follow the example of Jesus himself. Secondly, we worship weekly because we're following the example of the early church. You see, worship was a critical time for those early Christians, folks. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, we read on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Now that our passage goes on to say, Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept talking on until midnight. Now, as a preacher, I love that second part of the passage, <laughs> that Paul got to preach until midnight, but it's the first part of the passage that I want you to notice. It says they came together on the first day of the week to break bread. So they came together to take communion every Sunday. They saw the value whether it be corporately as the body of Christ, or whether it be individually as a Christian, they saw value in remembering the sacrifice of Jesus. There's a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 where the Apostle Paul writes, now about the collection of God's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of each week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money and keep you with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collection will have to be made. Now, I know some people use this as a proof text to take the offering in a worship service, but listen to me, it's much more than that, folks. It shows just how important worshiping together was for those early Christians. And the Bible says that they continued steadfastly in their worship on the first day of the week. There's another reason that we worship weekly, and that is for accountability, or for fellowship, we would say. When you worship weekly, accountability-wise, you are placing yourself under the spiritual leadership of the church. And if you regularly go to church, or if you only meet with two or three other Christians in your living room, then you're not only missing out on opportunities of service and evangelism opportunities, but most importantly, you are missing the opportunity to be accountable as the Bible says, that biblical structure of having elders who oversee the spiritual affairs of the church and who make sure that doctrinal purity is being taught. I've seen some false teaching. I've seen some legalism. I've seen some bizarre behaviors sprout from people who reject the institutional church, who refuse to place them under the, under the authority of spiritual leaders. And some of you have seen that too, folks. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 reminds us that we're to obey our leaders and submit to their authority. For they keep watch over us as men who must give an account. And then the Bible says, obey them so that their work may be a joy. Not a joy. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm talking to someone who's made some, well, let's just call it some unwise choices in their lives. And as a result of that, they fall into an addiction or a pattern of life where they're making selfish decisions and affecting family, it's affected their, their friendship, it's affected their job. In most cases, I will eventually ask that person, have you been going to church lately? And invariably, their response is, well, oh no, I haven't. And you want to know why? Because it makes people uncomfortable when they come to church and hear a message that many times points out the duplicity in their life. And rather than put themselves in a position where the Holy Spirit can convict them of that shortcoming and channel them to repentance and make the healthier choices in their life, they just simply stop coming. They don't want to have to deal with it. Or so they think. Because eventually they do. Eventually they'll have to pay for it. They may have to deal with it months later when they go through a divorce. They may have to deal with it weeks down the road when the boss pulls them aside and says, you're going to be devoted or you're going to be fired because of your behavior, it's affecting your job performance. You see, folks, the accountability, the fellowship of the church can read life into the spiritual life of a person that many times 
is futile because of its separation from the church. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the Weight Watchers organization, but they've been incredibly successful due to this accountability and the fellowship that they offer. The premise is that you have to come to a meeting or a group meeting in order to be in good standing with them. I don't know if you understand it, a couple of years back, they decided they were going to try an online program version of Weight Watchers where people could email one another back and forth. You probably hadn't heard about it because it wasn't very successful. And they had to modify it completely because it just didn't work. You see, they learned that there was no substitute for coming in person to be face-to-face -face with other people. In other words, fellowship and accountability. That leads us to the next reason of why we should worship. And that is an act of obedience. The Bible commands that we come together to worship. Once again, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, our passage this morning, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Now that's not only found in the New Testament, even back in the Old Testament. God included worship in the Ten Commandments. Remember what he said? Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy? And so part of what you're doing this morning, by being here in this service, if you are doing what God has called you to do, what you're doing, you're doing out of a sense of duty. You're in God's house because you're following God's command to be here. But even in those times, you'll be amazed at how, how God can bring good and encourage you. I remember years ago, this is way back when Roger Clinton, remember that name, folks? Pitched for the Houston Astros at the time, but he was new to be pitch a game, and his mother had passed away just a few hours earlier that day. Well, Roger Clemens chose to go ahead and pitch that game before Jordan Mellon was hanged. Astro General Manager at the time, Tim Cora, said, Roger's mother calls him about to. And Roger feels like it's his duty to pitch for the Astros tonight, and so that's what he's chosen to do. Folks, I share that story with you because there is a sense of duty as to why you're here. You're here because you know that it's your duty to do so. Even if you don't feel like it. I was once told by a church member about this very thought. He said, well, coming to church is kind of like kissing your wife. I said, well, how is that? And he said, well, sometimes you do it for enjoyment, but sometimes you just do it out of duty. <laughs> you understand what he means? Now, listen, you're laughing about that. But what he said is, sometimes you kiss your spouse and there's those spark and there's the, the light fireworks light in the sky. But sometimes it's just that perfunctory kiss when you're on your way out to work. Or when you go to sleep. Sometimes you come to church just like that, out of a act of obedience. And so maybe you come and the, the music just doesn't grab you or the, the preaching just doesn't connect with you, but yet you're here. And you're here because you know that if you're here, you can put yourself in a position where God can speak to you. By the way, you may not know this, but the first mention in the Bible of the word worship was found when God asked Abraham, take his one and only son up to the mountain and offer him as a sacrifice. Remember that story? It was the foreshadowing of the New Testament redemption story of Jesus, but in Genesis chapter 22, verse 5, Abraham said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go up over there. Here's that first phrase. We will worship and then we will come back. I want you to think about that verse in context. When Abraham went up to that mountain to worship, he didn't have much to worship about. So. In fact, I don't think he felt like worshiping at all because he knew what he was about to do. And so his worship was more out of a sense of duty than it was obedience. And when God saw his commitment level, if you recall, then God spared the life of Abraham's son and everything changed. What Abraham thought would be anything but worship became the best worship experience of his life. Another reason that we worship weekly, and I talked about this earlier, is to express our appreciation. Folks, when you come to worship, it's not about you. In fact, worship literally means to ascribe value or worth to someone. Why? Because we consider him to be worthy of honor or reverence. Worship is a celebration of what God has done for you. It's your chance to express to God your appreciation for what he's done for you. Another 
and probably the last reason that many would choose to worship weekly is for the inspiration that it provides, for the comfort that it brings. Now, I'm going to be honest, sometimes we put too much emphasis on that reason, inspiration, comfort, and worship. But the fact of the matter is that the result of true worship at times is inspiration, is comfort. I remember several years ago when a lady in our church in Ohio, where I was ministering, lost her husband in his battle with cancer on a late Saturday afternoon. The very next morning, Sunday morning, visibly shaken, she staggered her way into our worship service. And I said to her, if there was anybody who had a reason to stay home, it would be you today. And then she said to me, I need the comfort that God's people can bring to my life. I need the comfort of God's word in my heart. Now, please don't measure your inspiration by whether or not your, this worship service meets your preferences. You know what I mean when I say your preferences. We sing the song that you like. We preach the sermon that you like. Because your faithfulness, your attendance, can actually inspire and comfort people without you even knowing it. Just the fact that I told you that story about the woman who lost her husband the day before, and she's in church on Sunday morning, has to move you to say, there's got to be something of value when God's people come together. How many times have we talked about other people who, despite their difficulties, make Sunday church attendance a priority? I had an elder that uh, shared with us back in London, Virginia, for years. He had the house on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and there were times when he would come into Sunday morning just completely dragging. And I would say the same thing to Billy. Billy, if anybody needed to stay home today, it would be you. Look at you. I know you feel bad. But he just said, I just want to be with God. There's value in that. And there's some of you who say, man, I could be, I hope I could be like that. And you can. You may never realize the simple fact that you may be an encouragement to other people by just you being here today. You may inspire someone, a co-worker, or one of your patients, or one of your students, or, or one of your neighbors, or one of your family members, by just being in church, just even when you don't feel like it. If you've ever been involved in the life of this church, whether it's volunteering, whether it's worshiping, whether it's studying God's Word, in those difficult hours, you will find that you want to be here. Because the body of Christ will minister to you like no one else can. Someone, someone said, true worship has a way of disturbing those who are comfortable and comforting those who are disturbed. It may be due to, the, to a death, a divorce, a tragedy, but regardless of the cause, true worship can be that sad that, that you place on those open wounds and begin the teaching process. You remember the Gospel account in John, in the sixth chapter, there was a time when Jesus begins to leak out the masses that were following him. He began to raise their level of commitment. According to John chapter 6, verse 66 and following, we, from that time on, many of Jesus' disciples turned back and no longer followed him. So Jesus turned to those twelve and he said, You don't want to leave me too, do you? And it's a sign of you. Impetuous sign of you who said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the word to be trusted. We believe and know that you're the only, the Holy One of God. Folks, that's why we worship. Because we have nowhere else to go where we can find true meaning and true purpose in life. We know that he's the Holy One of God. And so that's why we come together to worship. Now that being said, real quickly, I'll do this real quickly. How do we worship? I know we can worship in a variety of ways, in a variety of places. But I think we need to change our concept when it comes to worship. You see, it's not just about coming to church for an hour or two every week. First of all, we worship through our preparation. In other words, we prepare ourselves before we come here. The reason that we prepare for things is because they're important to us. And worship should be important to us. And so we should become, we should come spiritually prepared. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and following says it this way, Therefore, brother, since we have confidence in the most holy place by the blood of Christ, by a new and living way opened up to us through the curtain that is his body, 
And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Listen to this phrase. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. In full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Now, most Bible scholars think that that last phrase, having our bodies washed with pure water, was a reference to the Old Testament people, what they would do as they would enter the temple to worship. You see, in those days when they would enter the temple to worship, they would find filled with water, this water basin. And it wasn't so much a physical cleansing as much as it symbolized that, that they were preparing themselves, that they were ready to worship. They were in the right mindset to worship God. And I'm here to remind you that there should be a sense of anticipation, but also a sense of preparation when you come to worship. That's why we don't know to do it on Saturday night, folks. Preach right now. Someone once said the reason not much happens on Sunday morning is because too much happened on Saturday night. True worship requires some advanced planning and preparation. But we don't just worship through our preparation, we also worship through our participation. I love this phrase. As you come to worship each Sunday, you participate, first of all, by being appreciative of those that you come in contact with. The people who welcome you at the door. The Sunday school teacher who prepared that lesson so that you could be taught. The nursery worker who's taking care of your child while you're in here. The song leader and the band who prepared themselves to lead you into a time of worship. We begin by expressing our appreciation for those individuals. Make sure you do that before you leave today. You participate by being friendly with those that you come in contact with. I've often said, I hope that you enjoy your experience. I hope the people around you make you feel welcome. And this is what I will often say. If not, then I hope you'll come back next week and set somewhere else. <laughs> because there's some good people who are glad that you're here. And they want to welcome you. Arrive early so that you'll be on time for worship. Greet those around you before we have to tell you so. Psalm 95, verse 6 says it this way, Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our man. We participate by singing. As we sing, our hearts show the type of submission that David talked about in Psalm 95. By the way, speaking of that verse, the Bible says that we're to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, and I realize that some of you may think that your voice is not very joyful. But I'm going to remind you, it's not the quality of your voice. It's the heart from which it comes. <coughs> so there's a pass to those of you who like me don't have the best of singing. I'll tell this real quick. It's not in my notes, but I told it this past week tonight in my Bible study. There was a time when I was preaching in Glenland, Virginia. And we were there was a guest speaker, so the opportunity for special music came open, and I thought I've led music all my life. I felt comfortable. I thought, well, I'll just sing the special that day. And so I sang the special. People need the Lord. Remember that song that Cal Bold? But anyway, finished singing it. And when the church was over, I expected what I would do with those who sing. I pat them on the back. Thank you for the song. Nobody <laughs> said <anything. laughs> I'm telling you the truth. When the service was over, I finally found one of my friends. I thought, well, I'll just pull a little bit of the praise out. I said to Jack, how do you think that did? And Jack Jesse, who was one of our elders, put his arm on my shoulder and said, You did the best you can. And he walked off. <laughs> <laughs> I learned very quickly that I make a joyful noise when I sing, or at least that's how I feel. But I still participate in those. We participate in the Lord's Supper. It's an opportunity for us. We were just reminded from David to, to get our bearings straight, to remind ourselves of the sacrifice of Jesus. We often say we don't limit our communion service to just the members of this local body. There is a thing called close communion, though, where only members of that particular church can share that kind of communion. But we have an open community. We believe that those who want to remember Jesus the way that he's asked to be remembered ought to do so. And so we invite you to do just that. We invite you to participate in that. E.L. says you don't have to participate in the offering, but I'm going to say differently, if you don't mind, E.L. You know? <laughs> because I think it's an opportunity for us to give generously as we did last. I think it reminds us. Now, I don't want to pressure you to get. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying, and that's what E.L. was trying to say. But I am saying that it is an opportunity us to express our appreciation to God and to show God that we know where it comes from and we know that this was Do you remember that time when King David's life and he wanted to offer up a sacrificial gift? Someone actually wanted to give him the gift that he wanted to offer. 
And according to 2 Samuel chapter 24, David's reply was, No, I insist on paying for it because I don't want to offer burnt offerings to the Lord that cost me nothing. Now, if you've ever said after a worship service, I didn't get much out of that service, maybe it's because you've got this consumer mentality. And my challenge for you is to change your attitude about worship. You need to realize that you're coming in here not to get something out of this, but you're coming in here to give something back. This is your means of expressing back to God. Another way to participate is to listen to the sermon, to give encouragement, to give affirmation. To nod in agreement. I didn't say nod off. I said nod in agreement. Sometimes I used to joke, I would love to sit in the pew and look at you, if you would be up here, look back at you the way some of you were looking at me when the preacher when he was preaching. You participate not all along these lines. I saw a statistic that said less than 50% of people bring Bibles today, and I understand that. But 80% of people bring smart ones that have Bibles. And it's been a hard thing for me to do as an old preacher, is to say, get your smartphones out and turn with me. But I realize that if 80% of you people have a Bible app on your smartphone, the best thing I can do is to challenge you to do that. So we didn't like it. And by the way, if something strikes you funny when the preacher is preaching, it's okay to laugh at it. And if it doesn't strike you as funny, but you know it was a tenth of that humor, well, the preacher will bone and laugh at you. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Participate by listening in take notes. <laughs> and during the invitation, I challenge you to not only stay, but I challenge you to pray with God. Pray that someone will be moved to accept Jesus Christ. So we worship through our preparation, we worship through our participation, and we worship through our practice. Thank you. See, worship is not just a once a week experience. Worship prepares us for a daily experience. To put into practice what we've been challenged to do when we gather together in the body of Christ. We have this expectation of you coming to church to worship with God's people. But if that's all you ever do for us, you're going to die in the body. Because you're not out there using what you've been taught to benefit us. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, specifically, Therefore I urge you, brothers, and through God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act. You see, the daily living of a spiritual, sacrificial, unselfish Christian life is your daily spiritual act of worship. Prayer is that ongoing source of strength. Your worship experience is how you get your spiritual battery to be charged. But we fail as a church, and you fail as an individual Christian. If all you ever do is come to church once a week and say, is that nice? If you don't put into practice what's called here, then you're simply a spectator, not a participant. You see, if we succeed in just getting you to drive in this church building once a week and stay here for about an hour, and that's where it stops, then we have failed you. Now, don't get me wrong, it's a great place to start, but it's a sad place to finish. John Oldberg said it this way, and I'll close with this final quote. He said it best when he said, Your work to God in public is only as strong as your work to Him in private. In other words, folks, that relationship that we build with Christ away from the church so that we can be obedient to the community is enhanced when we come together for worship. <laughs> but we bear that responsibility to let our lights shine daily in such a way that we might call people to Jesus Christ. That's the value of we worship. Pray for Father, thank you for that reminder. And thank you for the privilege that has been offered to assemble ourselves together for this community worship. I thank you for each and every